on the surface would be age. We talk about the aging process, and you are all familiar with it. But we have intrinsic and, and extrinsic aging. That's talking about chronological or internal aging. Our cells get old. Our protein gets old. Um, our genetic background influences the aging process. Some, some skin is more prone to wrinkles than other skin, right? You have people that don't do any skin care at all, and they still have what looks like flawless skin, and you're like jealous because they, their gen genes are just good that way. But when we age, we start seeing that wrinkling occur. Um, and then we can also accelerate that through extrinsic aging. If we're out in the sun, if we're exposed to a lot of pollution, this will cause our skin to age faster because we have things that are changing the epigenetic state. Inflammation, irritation are outside examples to our skin saying something's going wrong and we're not happy about it. So when we really look at the aging process, I think it's important for us to understand that the wrinkles that we see are indicators, they're visible indicators, but they're not necessarily showing the actual problem. The actual problem is that the health of our cells is compromised. All of the other things that cause the deep wrinkles in our skin are just visible, visible indicators of what's happening to our cells. Okay? I saw I was in Australia a few weeks ago and I was at a dermatology meeting, and uh, one of the particular meetings, presentations there was really cool because he was talking about diagnosing skin disorders, and that when they were diagnosing the skin disorders, they were finding a direct link to the skin telling the doctors quickly what internal problem was occurring. So our skin is oftentimes a great indicator of internal problems. In a similar way, wrinkles and the outward appearance of aging that we don't like because it's visible is all indicators that our cellular health is compromised. And so in order for us to change skin care, we have to treat the problem and not the symptoms. Okay? Have you heard that kind of in a medical term? A lot of times you treat the symptoms, you get a cold, and so after you got a cold, you start taking medicine to feel better. But in order to truly treat the cold the best way possible, you have to attack the cold itself, or you need to prevent the cold from ever occurring. When we look at the treatments that have happened through the years, and dermatologists recognize this, Traditional treatments use what I call strategic damage to the skin. The problem with strategic damage is that you're not treating the problem, you're treating the symptom. Okay? One of the reasons why strategic damage works in skin care is because of the unique property of our skin. Our skin is the largest organ of the body. You guys have heard that before, right? It covers our entire body. It's an amazing organ. And our skin is unique in that our skin turns over, right? It turns over regularly. And because of that unique property of this particular organ, it allows us to use treatments such as the strategic damage that will turn the skin over and start it over. The key problem to this type of treatment is that you're treating the symptom and you're not necessarily changing the health of your skin. I like to point out that when you look at what happens after an aggressive or intense peel, chemical peel in, the, in a dermatology office, what typically occurs to the skin? Is it inflamed? Yes. Does it, does it peel or flake off? Yes. Now, Let's compare that to what happens if you go out to the beach without sunscreen and spend four or five hours in high heat, high sun. What's going to happen to your skin? Will it be inflamed? Yeah. Will it peel? Yeah. They're very similar to what's happening. The skin is responding in a very similar way. 
Now that's not to say that these traditional treatments are bad. There's certainly uh, benefits to these in certain conditions and certain treatments that you want to have to the skin. However, I do firmly believe that we use these types of treatments far too often. How many of you have seen in the beauty industry people who have used too many peels and it's destroyed their skin? All of us have experienced that or seen that. And part of the reason for that is that people are not treating the actual problem. They're not improving the health of their cells. And so when we look at the future of skin science, where we need to go with this, it absolutely has to be changing or improving that epigenetic profile so that your cells are in their happy state. They're in their youthful state. By so doing, this will be the easiest way or the best way that we can actually can capture the fountain of youth, that we can actually make ourselves healthy. And by making ourselves healthy, that improves all of the visible signs of aging. So hydropeptide is dedicated to creating solutions that benefit the long-term health of skin. That's our objective as a company is to develop products that really can impact the epigenetic state and reset it to this happy state. So today, uh, we've talked a little bit about epigenetics and I wanna give you a little bit of a highlight of some of the technology that we use uh, in order to, to achieve this. And also give you a little bit of a snapshot of the future of where we wanna go with this as well. So the first category that hopefully is somewhat obvious for a company that's called Hydropeptide, is that we use peptide technology. Uh, peptides are a wonderful ingredient because they are cell communicators. Does everyone here know what peptides are? So we talked a little bit about DNA. DNA is an important product, but so are proteins. What are proteins and peptides made from? What's their building block? Aaron, do you know the answer? I do. What is it? Amino acids. All right, amino acids. Have you guys heard of amino acids? Yeah. So amino acids are the building blocks of proteins, okay? We have 20 amino acids that the body uses and needs in order to make the, those thousands and millions of proteins that every cell has, okay? So every protein and peptide is made up of amino acids. The difference between a peptide and a protein is just the length, okay? When we say two amino acids linked together, so I can draw two amino acids linked together. There's, they have this chemical makeup. They have an amine group, NH3, a carbon, and then a carboxyl group. This is the COO. The COO minus is very nice because it will readily bind to the amine group of another amino acid. So you can take one amino acid, and this little R group represents that each amino acid has a unique group that makes it unique, okay? But we can take this one amino acid and we can link it to another amino acid. So NH3, so these two link together right here. And so we have two amino acids together Two amino acids linked together form a peptide, or in this case, a dipeptide, meaning two amino acids. If we linked another one, so it was three amino acids together, it would form a tripeptide, okay? And we typically talk about peptides in skincare in the range of two up to about ten amino acids linked together. When it gets larger, like above 50 amino acids, it becomes a protein, okay? But these, uh, these peptides can be a very valuable ingredient for us in skincare. Let me give you the classic example of the first peptide that was used in skincare. For many, many years, we knew that collagen was an important protein for skin. We've known that for, for decades. And, and Way back in you know, the early 70s, they said, well, maybe we should put collagen into our skin creams. 
And if we put it into our skin creams and put it onto our bodies, we'll, we'll support the skin. Did it work? It didn't work. And the reason for that is that collagen is a very large protein. And just putting it on the surface of our skin, it doesn't integrate. It doesn't become part of our collagen network that supports our cells. Okay? As they still continue to study collagen, though, one of the things they found is that when collagen gets old, it's broken down into peptide fragments. Okay? So collagen is this really long protein. You kind of cartoon it as a kind of like in the shape of a worm. And you can have collagen bound together, they form this matrix, and this matrix helps to support the cell. Well, when a particular collagen piece starts getting old, what happens is proteins or enzymes come in and chew it up, okay? Because we like to recycle our protein, because if we recycle them into amino acids, we can reuse them. And so the body naturally takes this old collagen and breaks it all up, okay? Well, one of the things that the scientists discovered is that this one particular protein fragment or peptide, the body used to tell fibroblasts to make new collagen. So we talk about that be ready state for the collagen gene in a fibroblast. When collagen breaks down and more and more of this peptide starts to accumulate around the cell, it acts as a signal or a trigger, a tipping scale that says, uh-oh, we have too much broken collagen in our environment. We need to make more collagen. So that peptide acts as a natural signal to the body that says, make more collagen. If too much of it is in the environment of the cell, then the fibroblast will make more collagen. And then it turns off after it's made enough collagen to change the balance. So when scientists discovered this, they said, well, maybe instead of collagen, whole protein, what if we only put this protein fragment or this peptide into a skin cream? What will happen? And lo and behold, they added it to a skin cream, and it helped the production of collagen. And so ta-da, we had the first peptide used in skin cream. Well, the really awesome thing about peptides is they're not just one peptide. Peptides are very versatile. They are unique. Each sequence is unique. When we look at the versatility of peptides, you can look at it on two different levels. Amino acids, those 20 amino acids, are oftentimes um, defined with letters. So for example, we have three different letters to make a tripeptide. In this case, I just made the tripeptide GHK. Okay. This particular peptide can be used in skin care, and it does a particular activity. The interesting thing is that we can change the order of the amino acids, and instead of GHK, we can use the amino acid sequence KHG. This is a completely different peptide, and it does a different activity in the skin. So they are versatile because they are unique. This particular peptide will do one activity, and this one will do another one. And we can do lots of different combinations. In fact, there's infinite amounts of peptides that we can use. As we research and study peptides, we sometimes find peptides that work a little bit better. That very first peptide that was used for collagen works really well, but as we've researched that, we've found unique sequences that work even better. And so we can use peptides to stimulate collagen. We can have them stimulate uh, elastin production. We can have them do a lot of different things. We actually categorize peptides into a couple different categories to help describe their activities within the cell. The first example is like the collagen example. It acts, a peptide can act as a signaling molecule. As a signaling molecule, this means it can tell those B-ready genes, those B-ready genes can be told whether they should be turned on or turned off. Okay? That's kind of cool because you can have a peptide that sends a signal to say fibroblast, 
turn on collagen. We can also have a unique peptide that can tell the proteins that eat collagen, that cut it up. We can say, hey, you're, you're, you're eating up too much collagen. We're going to have a peptide signal that says, you guys turn off. So we can have one peptide that turns on collagen, another peptide that slows down the breakdown of collagen, and by combining the two, we can actually amplify the, the signal of collagen production. In addition, we can find other peptides like this category that are called enzyme inhibitors. So the enzymes or proteins that chew up collagen, they're called metalloproteinases. They, they bind and cut up old collagen, which is a good thing. We want them to recycle collagen. But sometimes through inflammation of the skin, they become hyperactive. And so we want to kind of slow them down. We can do that by telling the gene to not express so much. And we can also use a peptide that actually comes and binds to the, to the enzyme and blocks its activity. It can block it from chewing up the collagen. So when you combine all three of them together, you can really amplify the collagen signal. So this is a way in which we can combine multiple peptides together to generate an even bigger response to what we want. Now it's not just collagen, of course. We found peptides that are involved in blocking um, melanin synthesis. We have found peptides that can help with um, fat, uh, fat cell development. Peptides that can block the activity of the acne um, bacteria. And so all of these versatile peptides can be combined in unique ways to really amplify the signal. Now, of course, peptides is not the only thing that hydropeptide does. We also, as the name hydropeptide suggests, we also want to use other key ingredients to create that healthy state of the cell. Hydration is a really important category for us to uh, generate vibrant and youthful skin. If our, if our skin is dehydrated, that's one of the first things that will cause that epigenetic state to change. And so we use different categories of uh, hydrators, emollients, humectants, ceramides, inclusives. We use these throughout our, our portfolio, throughout our product line because it's an important part of keeping the skin happy and healthy. So by hydrating the skin and then using the peptide signals, we can really generate a nice response to the skin. And that's kind of how the name hydropeptide came to be. Right, the hydration component and the peptide component. We also have some other key ingredients that I can touch briefly on today uh, that are very important because they synergize nicely with peptides. Uh, we use peptides as our signaling molecule, uh, but we combine them with other important ingredients like antioxidants, uh, botanical nutrients, uh, hyaluronic acid. These are all uh, key ingredients that benefit and keep the skin healthy. And they also benefit the peptides because they improve the technology. Let's talk briefly about some of these other key ingredients that are part of the hydropeptide brand. Uh, antioxidants are a really important uh, topic or product, or I should say ingredient. Um, does everyone know what an antioxidant is? Antioxidant is a molecule that helps to prevent free radical damage. Uh, free radicals are just molecules that are in an unhappy state. Uh, we talk about that electron. Um, this is important. Electrons are, uh, an unpaired electrons is a natural part of the, the cellular activity. The problem with free radicals is that they start doing damage because they're so unhappy that they'll take from anyone. So a, a good example of a free radical damage is that free radicals will sometimes bind to the DNA, that DNA blueprint, and cause the mutation, which we don't want to have happen. And so these antioxidants are really important in preventing free radicals from doing damage to the cell. Um, we sometimes call them reactive oxygen species as well. 
We can have free radicals accumulate through things like photo damage uh, from the sun, um, pollution, will uh, in increase uh, free radicals in, in our system. And there are different types of free radicals too, and these free radicals can attack different parts of the cell. And we've talked about cellular health, free radical damage is one of the main problems in creating inflammation and irritation to the skin and changing that epigenetic profile. And so when we look at antioxidants, it's important also to recognize that there are different types of antioxidants. And all of these antioxidants are important because they will bind or, or attack different types of free radicals. So within hydropeptide brand, we incorporate a broad spectrum of antioxidants uh, to allow us to cover and attack all different types of free radicals. Uh, we have some of the categories here. We have our own body defense. These are enzymes or proteins that our body naturally produces to block free radicals. The superoxide dismutase is a good example. Coenzyme Q10, glutathione. We have peptides and other things that will stimulate these antioxidants and stimulate them to be more uh, efficient at blocking and attacking free radicals. We also, of course, know about the important vitamins that act as free radicals, vitamin E, vitamin C, vitamin A. These are all ones that we get from nutritional sources. Um, we, of course, will add all of these to our formulas as well. We have products that have vitamin C in them. Um, we have products that have vitamin E and these help to stabilize um, the formula itself as well. One of the things I like to point out is that antioxidants are important both for putting onto the skin, for eating, and also for the product stability. Um, peptides could be vulnerable within the formula to free radical damage as well. And so we use antioxidants also to stabilize the actual formula that we we also use some key botanical nutrients, such as resveratrol, uh, white and green tea extracts that allow for very potent combinations of antioxidants. So these are great sources and great natural sources for antioxidants. We also know that antioxidants are great brightening um, ingredients. Uh, melanin synthesis and, and Hyperpigmentation is a problem globally. A lot of people want to have better color to their skin, or if they have a hyperpigmentation spot, it's all oftentimes a concern. Uh, this is due to uh, melanin synthesis uh, being created by an enzyme known as tyrosinase. Now, tyrosinase, I'm sure all of you are familiar with, but it's an enzyme that is stimulated by things like inflammation, it's stimulated by free radical damage. So by adding antioxidants, they become natural brighteners because they reduce the activity of tyrosinase by, by taking care of the free radical. We also have peptides that can block the pathway that leads to tyrosinase enzyme activity. Uh, we have peptides that block different parts of this pathway, and by combining them, we can make a very effective product at brightening. Um, we have a, a good product called Even Out. It's a serum that incorporates a lot of these different ingredients that you can see on this screen. Uh, we have peptides and other natural brighteners that we use to help to keep the skin brightened and, and, and prevent melanin synthesis from being overreactive. All right, the third category I want to spend a little bit of time on because I think that we have sometimes some misconceptions about what stem cells are. Uh, who's heard of stem cells? Do we, have, do we have a good understanding of what they are? I want to give you a, a couple of key terms so that you know uh, how to define a stem cell versus a normal cell. Okay? We've talked a lot about today about epigenetic regulation and that epigenetic regulation helps a liver cell be a liver cell, an eye cell be an eye cell. A stem cell, by definition, is a cell that's in its raw state. It's in its new state. It's in its be ready state. So when we look at a stem cell, the epigenetic regulation hasn't occurred yet. A stem cell is still able to become that liver cell. It can still become an eye cell. Um, we sometimes use for describing 
stem cells and their steminess by using words like totipotent. Totipotent means all powerful. A totipotent stem cell would be like an embryonic stem cell. An embryonic stem cell is cool because it is still in its most raw state. An embryonic stem cell is one that can become any cell it needs to be throughout the body. That's what makes embryonic stem cells so important in the development process is those two initial cells in the sperm and egg bind together. They are literally able to become every single cell in the entire human body. The, the, the development process is fascinating. So these cells are totally potent. Now, within our human adult bodies, we have stem cells that aren't totipotent. They're typically called pluripotent. Pluripotent means many powerful. In other words, they are cells or stem cells that have had, they've had some epigenetic regulation occur, but they can still become a lot of different things. A great example of it is our skin stem cells. Skin, skin stem cells are not Totipotent, but they are pluripotent. This is important because it makes it so that you don't have an eyeball, eyeball spout, you know, coming out of your elbow. Okay. But skin stem cells have the ability to become all different types of skin. The fibroblasts, the fat cells. These stem cells are able to create all of these different types. Now, an important part of what makes a stem cell a stem cell is its ability to stay a stem cell. When we talk about cell division, cell division is a really cool process. We've heard of mitosis. Mitosis is when one cell actually splits into two. But mitosis is part of what's called the cell cycle. In order for a cell to divide into two, we have to have it grow. We call this the growth one stage. And then S stands for synthesis. This is when the DNA is duplicated. Remember how the DNA is the same in every single cell? When it, so in order for a cell to divide from one into two cells, it has to duplicate its DNA. And that DNA duplication has to be perfect. Remember, we don't want the DNA to change. So this is a really important process in our bodies where the cell duplicates the DNA in preparation. We're dividing. They also have to make sure there's enough protein for both types of cell. Okay, so this happens with any kind of cells that divide. The unique property that makes a stem cell a stem cell is that when a stem cell divides, one part of the cell stays a stem cell, okay, while the other one changes. And this has to do with the epigenetic regulation. We sometimes call this the mother cell because it's divided and stayed the same, and the daughter cell. The daughter cell has had epigenetic regulation and changes so that it now is told to become a new cell. Now here's an important part with stem cells and skincare. Can one stem cell talk to another stem cell? What do you think? We've talked about a stem cell, by definition, is a cell that's in its most be-ready state. As a be-ready state, that means that it's ready to be told what to do. It doesn't know what to do yet. A stem cell, by definition, is, what, what do I need to do? What do you want me to become? It's in that be-ready state. So a stem cell does not talk to another stem cell. Both of those, this stem cell and this stem cell, are both saying, what should I do? What should I do? What do you want me to become? They aren't telling each other what to become. They're getting signals from other sources, other cells that say, you know what? We don't have enough fibroblasts right now. We're not making enough collagen. We need to make more fibroblasts. And so that stem cell is waiting and waiting. All of a sudden it receives a signal. And that signal says, we need to make more fibroblasts. And so it says, okay. And so the stem cell gets ready to go through the cell cycle. And in that cell cycle process, one cell stays a stem cell, the mother cell, while the other cell begins preparation to become a fibroblast. Okay? So stem cells do not talk to other stem cells. Does that make sense? So how do we use them in, in our 
<coughs> well, I want to talk to you a little bit about plant stem cells and how they differ from human stem cells, okay? Plant stem cells, just like human stem cells, are cells that can become whatever they need to become, okay? Now, we've established that stem cells don't talk to other stem cells, right? Plant stem cells definitely don't, do not talk to our skin stem cells directly, right? They're not the same, and they don't talk to each other. So the way that we use stem cells in skin care is that we can take plant tissue and we can isolate them into the lab. We have them in a lab, we put them in what's called a Petri dish, and we can grow them up. The interesting thing when you look at stem cells in plants is these are stem cells that are kind of like those embryonic stem cells. They're totally potent. They're all powerful, meaning that plant stem cells can become whatever they need to become in the plant. Plants are kind of cool over us because they have the ability to regrow things. We cut off the limb of our arm, it's not growing back. Plants have the ability to grow things back. When we cut off a root, it grows another root. There are some cool animals like frogs that have the ability to regenerate limbs, but we don't have that ability yet. Maybe sometime in the future. We'll talk about that maybe five years from now or so, or 20 or 30, I don't know. But our ability to use these plant stem cells is because they can become whatever we want them to become. And so when we take them into the laboratory, what we're doing is we are sending signals to the stem cell and telling them to become a particular type of cell in, from that plant. And what we're telling them, or the signals that we're using, is telling them to become rich in valuable nutrients for the body. So we can tell through this process a plant stem cell to become a, a cell that's rich in antioxidants, rich in flavonoids, and other nutrients that our body and our skin benefit from. So a couple things to point out from what we described today on, on stem cells. And I don't read Lemma so up. I'll get this here. So some common myths are that botanical <coughs> stem cells, they don't contain magical properties. Uh, we don't use botanical stem cells to create new human stem cells. Uh, botanical stem cells do not directly communicate with our skin stem cells. And botanical stem cells are not derived from human or animal stem cells. Okay? So what do they do? Botanical extracts or stem cells can be give us uh, unparalleled protective qualities to the skin. When we grow them under these controlled conditions in the lab, we're able to create super rich antioxidants. And each extract can be rich in different types of nutrients that that particular plant can provide. I think this is also a value because it becomes an eco-friendly <coughs> way to get nutrients from plants. Uh, when we use botanical extracts, uh, we're taking the components within that, that extract that are proteins and nutrients and we're, and we're utilizing them for skin care. With uh, botanical stem cells, we do it in an eco-friendly way by doing it in the lab where we can scale it up without having to use acres and acres of land uh, to produce that plant. So it's an eco-friendly way to get nutrients from plants. Now, sometimes I get asked, why do you use botanical stem cells and not human stem cells? And I say, well, it's because <laughs> botanical stem cells are very different than human stem cells. You use them for different things. Uh, we use the botanical stem cells to get nutrients that are beneficial to us that are derived from plants. When we eat food, we eat plants, right? Why do we eat plants? Because they have nutrients. Do we eat human flesh? I hope not. Anyone? Okay. Good. It, it, it's gross, but it's also because it's not practical. We don't get the nutrients we need from a human source. We get them from a botanical source. So those nutrients are, are important to the skin because we cannot generate them ourselves. Now, that's not to say that human stem cell technology is bad. We don't use it in hydropeptides. We only use this botanical stem cell technology. There are companies that use human stem cell technology. And what they're doing is in a similar way. They're not 
they're not applying human skin or human stem cells to the skin. What they're doing is they're using the laboratory technique to generate or, or to change or tell signals to the human stem cells to be, to be rich in growth factors and things like that. Okay? But that's a different source of material than what it would be with botanicals and stem cells. Does that make sense? Okay. Any questions on that? So one of the things that uh, companies use for human stem cell technology is to generate growth factors. Um, growth factors are, of course, an important part. And this is just an example slide showing that we have different types of plants that can provide different nutrients. So we use different uh, stem cell technology because each plant is unique. Um, growth factors are the last category I wanted to talk to you about very briefly. And this is just showing that growth factors are part of that signaling process that we've been talking about. We don't specifically use growth factors in our products uh, for two reasons. One, uh, peptide technology does a similar thing that we're sending signals to the cell. Uh, peptides, because they are much smaller, are able to penetrate the skin barrier more meaningfully. Uh, growth factors are quite large, and so the technology to uh, have growth factors penetrate the skin is, is challenging. Uh, we, we don't have to worry about that because we use the peptide technology instead. Um, but these growth factor signals are really important because they're parts of the signaling process that tells the genes which ones should be turned on and which ones should be turned off. We do use some botanical growth factor activators. And these are plant extracts that, similar to peptides, can cause or generate growth factor signals. Okay? So like our crocus chrysanthus uh, extract is able to stimulate the growth factors in fibroblasts that are used to stimulate elastin production. And we can also use extracts like the sacred lily extract that will reduce oil production in pseudopods. And so these work similar to the peptides in that they're stimulating the pathway that tells the genes what should be turned on and what should be turned on. We have one last category of the science portion of this meeting, and that's our probiotics. Uh, probiotics are really cool. Um, we've, we're, they're becoming really popular because we have a lot of knowledge now of what's called our microbiome, right? Our gut, the, there's bacteria in our gut, and it's important that we keep it happy. Just like we're talking about keeping our cells happy, we have to keep our microbiome happy. And we do that through our diet. Um, probiotics are oftentimes part of our nutritional diet um, because they can help improve the bacteria flora in our gut. Um, and so probiotics are used as a great dietary source. Um, we also are starting to use them in skincare. Um, we currently use uh, probiotic extract. So in this case, we are using not live bacteria, um, but we're using the extracts from the probiotics or the, the contents within them. Uh, probiotics literally means good bacteria. And what that means is that the bacteria have the ability to reduce bad bacteria. Uh, when we look at inside the uh, probiotics, you can find interesting peptides that are um, part of the bacteria that will block and reduce bad bacteria. So we can take those bacteria peptides and use them in our formulas to help uh, as a preservative to the actual formula. So we use uh, these two bacteria strains uh, for a preservative system within our formulas. This is one approach that has allowed us to remove um, controversial preservatives like parabens and phenoxyethanol and remove them from our formulation. So we have a, a, a much stabler uh, preservative uh, through this system. It's also beneficial to the skin. Uh, because of the pro nature of probiotics, they've been shown to help their acne. Uh, they've improved the energy of the cell, as well as um, by, by improving the energy, it also stimulates the follicles to grow. So the good bacteria right now are, are I think, a trend that will continue within skincare and will continue to leverage it in hydropeptides. 
So I'm going to turn the time over now to Erin. Uh, she's going to talk to you a little bit about the product and give you some highlights of some of the new products that we've recently launched.